My name is Will Prince, the Director of Development and Membership with the Louisiana Trust for Historic Preservation. In this video, we will be featuring a profile in preservation, highlighting a historic preservation project in places across the state. Today, we will be chatting with Megan Lord of Alexandria. We will be discussing her research and development of 2330 Hill Street in Alexandria. Hello, Megan. How are you today? Hey, Will. I'm great. Thank you. Before we get started, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Um, I am originally from Alexandria, so I grew up here um, in the newer part of town, not in our historic district. Um, I left the state to go to college um, and then left even further to go to graduate school. Never really thought that I would never intended to come back to Alexandria. Um, but my first job after grad school, um, which I do have a degree in preservation, um, was back in New Orleans. So we lived in New Orleans for a little while. And then once we had family, um, moved eventually moved back to Alexandria um, and have been here now for 10 years. Um, my first job back here was working with the city um, in their preservation department. And um, since I have left that job and am now doing preservation consulting and design consulting on my own. Great. Uh, so 2330 Hill Street is a great example of traditional residential housing. Could you share a little bit more about the house and its neighborhood, its different types of sure. architecture in that neighborhood, and then more about this this uh, this house in particular? Yeah. Um, so this house is a, the cutest little craftsman. Um, it is really, like you said, typical of the neighborhood and of the period. Um, it is in our local garden district, historic district. Um, and just one note about our historic districts in Alexandria. Uh, they were developed in the late 1970s, um, and the ordinance that was put in place when the city developed those districts it never actually, it's, it's in the books, but it was never pushed through, through. So a commission was not put in place, no design guidelines were put in place, um, and it wasn't until like the mid-2000s when a commission was actually developed in response to a demolition request, and so we've kind of got this crazy, weird history of having preservation, but not really doing it here in the city. And so um, makes projects like these in smaller houses, just typical residential architecture of the period, in my opinion, that much more important to preserve. We see a lot of them that um, are wrapped in vinyl siding that have windows replaced. And so to be able to find a project like this, um, a house like this in this neighborhood, and to know how original it is without really anything to undo or redo, um, is really special. So the the house, um, this one was built, I can get into that a little bit more, um, but probably the early 20s. And that's really typical of that neighborhood. It really developed um, beyond downtown in like the 19 teens through the 1930s was probably the height of building there. And um, was really, it is still the largest, our garden district is the largest neighborhood in town. Um, definitely the most diverse in architectural styles and um, probably the most diverse in demographics as well. So it's really a special place, um, a lot of character and a lot of great people that live there. Great, great. So, uh, you know, as you said, I mentioned it's a pretty large neighborhood, pretty large mix of styles and, and types of properties. How did you come across this pop property in particular? How did you, how did you find it? Yeah. Um, you know, I drive the area often because I live in the garden district and it's actually one on one of the busiest streets in the area. It's a through street, so it connects a lot of people. People use it, you know, um, for business travel often. Um, but I, when my clients approached me and said, Hey, we've bought this house. We think it's, it's great. Um, we want you to come look at it. I didn't even recognize it when they sent the picture or the address. So it kind of sits back on the lot. It's got some trees around it. Um, it's not a huge house. It doesn't scream for your attention. Um, but when I pulled up to it and went inside and saw what was there, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the perfect project. Um, I got really excited about it. So um, what else? My, my clients are really preservation minded. So, um, you know, they, when they liked it because, I mean, it's a great little, it will be an income producing property. Um, so they will either rent it out or possibly do an Airbnb, which we don't have a lot of here in town. Um, but it really has never been touched. And uh, that's that's the special thing about this one. Architecturally, on the exterior, it looks exactly the same as when it was built. And on the interior, as far as we can tell, 
other than a couple of maybe different flooring layers in the kitchen and the bathroom, um, everything is original. So it's, um, it's really great. Very nice. Uh, so since you started working on this property and with your clients, what type of research have you done and what type of tools in your research uh, have you discovered or used to learn mm -hmm. more about this property and, and, and its history? Yeah. Um, I kind of was thinking about it today. The house really came like with its own archive. It is full of stuff. The people that lived there, it's only had one owner, um, a husband and wife couple. And so they lived there from the time it was built until they, the husband passed away in 1961 and the wife in like the early seventies. Um, but the house has not been inhabited since, since um, 1969. And when they left, um, they really just closed the door and locked it. Apparently they had family that lived next door or nearby. So they would check on the house, but I mean, everything was still in there from the day that they left up to the you know, monogrammed towels hanging on the towel rack, medicine in the cabinet with their prescriptions written on it, jars of uh, canned fruit from their backyard, a list of when that was canned. So, so uh, uh, it was overwhelming um, at first to kind of walk into, of course it had been disheveled some, but um, whereas a lot of people probably, especially if they were purchasing that for an income producing property to rent out, they would have just brought in a dumpster and like chunked it all in the dumpster. Um, my clients were like, didn't do that. And they called me and they said, what, you know, look at this house. And so we've kind of slowly combed through it. We're still in that process because the house doesn't currently have electricity. It has not since I guess they shut it off in the seventies. So that's been an issue with being able to clean it up. It's kind of dark. We can't see in there. Um, but we've slowly been coming through. I think we have it to a place now where we've kind of pulled out all the things that we want to keep, but we found some really great things that have helped. Um, one, just even start off our research and um, identify who lived there and then given me a lot of information where I can go and kind of search more deeply and figure out the history behind the people who lived there and make some really cool connections. The things that we found in the house have like been there so that I can have substantiated some of the other research I've done. So I do. So typically I'll start off with the house and pull up the Sanborn maps. Um, so in this case, the 1921 Sanborn map didn't go for and show, show me far enough down the street to see the block where this house was on. Although I was pretty, you know, pretty sure it was there, um, but the map just didn't go that far. The 28 map did show the property and it showed it in exactly the same footprint. You know, no additions could be seen. The auto garage in the back was still there too. So um, in the house, we found two boxes of film negatives um, that looked very old, kind of delicate, in really old boxes. So we were able, I very carefully, gently took some out and um, we were able to hold them up to a light and then use an app to switch that negative so you could see what the developed photo would look like. Um, and that photo of the house that came up was just amazing to find. It showed me exactly what the Sanborn map, you know, said, and um, but just gave us a visual picture of the house. I mean, it really hasn't changed at all, except for the car in the garage. And in that old photo, it was, you know, a, a old Ford, like 19, I don't know, twenties or so. So it, you know, helped um, corroborate the date of, of the house, 1920s, early, you know, twenties, we think is when it was built. Hey, that's, that's an awesome find and, you know, lots to discover there. Um, and as you find these things, are you, are there, as, are there any like tipping points or once you find these items, are there any research tools in particular that you've used or plan to use to make, to bring all these connections and to learn about the, this house history? Yeah. Um, so I have, we found some letters in the house and they had, um, a return address to, um, Prague, Nebraska. Um, and all these things have kind of led me down different little rabbit holes and then they all connect back together. But what I'm getting at there is that, um, without that letter, I don't think I would have put together the connection of the Czech community here that we have in central Louisiana. Um, so there've been some local resources that I know we will pull in. Um, I'm kind of gathering all those and, but the, that letter to Nebraska um, and the last name that we've, of the, the couple that lived there, Wellcheck was their last name. 
um, led me to connect this house with the Wellcheck Farmstead, which is in Colleen um, across the river, um, just outside of Pineville, which um, is a property that was built in like the 19, early, the 19 teens um, by a Czech family there, that moved from the Nebraska, Kansas area and settled um, here in the like 1914s, 1915s. And so there are two communities, Labuse and Colleen um, in central Louisiana that are Czech communities. They moved here from the Midwest to resettle. And that was part of um, the Czech culture's attempt to kind of reassimilate um, Czech settlers who had moved to the United States and were kind of spreading out and assimilating into cities and that kind of culture. So they kind of resettled them and two of these communities were here locally. That's a part of our history locally that a lot of people don't know about. Um, so I'm hoping we do have a plan to go through these film negatives um, and to scan them properly with the right equipment um, and take care of them. And I'd love to donate and the, the negatives show, just peek through a couple and um, they show some farmland and farmsteads. I don't know if that's here um, in Colleen and could possibly be photos of that Wellcheck homestead or if that's from where they, they're um, land when they lived in Kansas and Nebraska. So there's some cool connections that could be nationwide too. Um, but I'd love to be able to digitize those, scan them, document them, give them to um, that local Czech um, community group here, or possibly the LSUA archives. And there's other connections like that that can be made. So um, that's a whole nother project in itself too. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting as we kind of, as preservation, we're sort of telling the whole story about these kind of uh, unknown representative communities within our own communities and, yeah. and we learn more about that and learn the traditions or architectural styles that really influence our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so you mentioned, um, you know, donating and working with the, these, uh, the film and so forth, but some of these other items like these household items, um, do you have any, are there any plans to find a way to preserve those artifacts or incorporate them into uh, other plans? Yeah, a lot of it, um, it, a lot of it will depend on what the end use of the property is. If the, my clients decide just to keep it as a rental property, um, then that, you know, we wouldn't put as much perhaps back into the house. If it's an Airbnb, then we may be able, which would be furnished. Um, I'd love to use, we found a whole drawer full of check stubs, you know, from the whole time that these people lived in the house. So you you writing checks for utility bills and that sort of thing. I'd love to kind of incorporate those into the design part and maybe find a cool glass lamp and fill it with the check stubs, just physical reminders in the design of the house that connect back to the house. Um, there's some wonderful cheesecloth wallpaper still on, on the walls in the house. And so it's not probably salvageable, but I love to use some of that as inspiration. If we can't replicate it um, or find a you know copy of the design to find something that's similar to put in a couple areas back in the house um, just to kind of, you know, remind a reminder of how it was originally designed. Um, so things like that, I do intend to, as I'm doing the research and we found so much, um, I'd love to make just a coffee table type book of documenting some of the digital things or things we've been able to digitize um, and then put that all together. So I don't know that the couple, they didn't have children. So I don't know how much family they still have in the area, but um, I, you know, it really tells the story of one of the sons of this Czech, you know, family that moved here. He went to, I found some records where he was in World War I um, and found his draft res registration cards and um, so really cool things like that that just tell his complete story. He immigrated with his family in 1892. He was born in Austria in 1888, and he's the only person that's ever lived in this house. So, um, I can't imagine, I just think it's a really special thing to, to have all of that information. It's one house and it tells the story of one person and one family. And so that's just kind of a cool thing. I want to make sure we document it the right way. I've been doing research and, and kind of, you know, planning out the, what the, the renovation plan and next steps for the house. What have been some of the challenges you've come across, whether it's, um, you know, the physical structure or just lining everything up to, to do the renovation. Yeah. Um, we, well, the house, because no one's lived in the house for so long, 
it's the house is not on the city's radar at all. Like it doesn't exist in any of their online databases because it doesn't have electricity. I guess they're not, no one's receiving a utility bill. Like when, when we went to apply for a permit, they didn't even know what house we were talking about because it just wasn't in their system. So that's a challenge um, to figure out. I mean, that's not my job, but they'll have to figure out how they're putting it in the system. Um, so we're working on that. And then along with the permit, we're really, so that's also been a bit of a challenge. We're not doing any structural work at all. There will be no new um, areas added onto the house, no structural changes at all. Really what we need to do is plumbing and electricity. Um, but the city's telling us that we need a licensed contractor to oversee the entire project. Um, so um, we're looking into, there's a Louisiana homeowner renovations license that will allow a homeowner to be the contractor for up to, if the project is under $75,000, $75,000. So um, the owner is looking into that. I'm also looking into that just as part of my consulting business. Um, this is a project, most of my projects are just consulting up to now. Um, they have been mostly tax credit projects. The owner would like me to sort of manage, you know, this project, um, not actually do the construction work, but manage the subs that are doing it. So I'm looking into how to do that properly through licensing, um, not the full fl full fledged contractor's license, but that under that homeowner license, which is um, particular in Louisiana. So um, those those challenges are we're working through them. Um, it'll you know, probably result in good growth for me as a business owner. Um, but it, you know, sometimes there's just not a, a guideline for how to do that <laughs> easily. So. A lot of interesting artifacts, you know, essentially a house left in time. Um, as we move forward with the renovation and things like that, are you using any incentives or, or active, you know, what activities or programs um, that might are going to use to restore the house and what are some of the first things, you know, after, you know, cleaning and identifying a lot right. of facts, what are some of the first things that, you know, need to be done or you're going to uh, take on at this property? Yeah. So um, we will be applying for the state um, tax credits and that's really the only ones that we're eligible for. Um, but we do want to take advantage of those. Uh, really the house doesn't need a ton of uh, structural work. It needs to be rewired and be replumbed. Um, which can be large expenses. So um, that along with some of the other exterior painting um, of the siding, restoring the wood windows, um, repainting the entire house actually on the exterior. Um, and then on the interior, just cleaning up really well, there will be some painting to be done in there um, and refinishing of some of the original features. But we do intend to apply for tax credits for that work. Um, and then... Um, which will mean it will need to be income producing. So that's part of the plan. If it were, um, you know, unfortunately we don't have the residential state tax credit anymore, which is what I love to use because I love to see single family homes like this, you know, return to single family residential homes and not income producing in our neighborhood sometimes. But, um, but I, you know, I am sure that with this project, the owners will be, um, you know, mindful of, of who's renting and how they're um, keeping up the neighborhood. And it, the end result will be um, one that's great for preservation and um, the project will be a benefit to the neighborhood. 